Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we are uh, very happy to have Luis Vilasa here once again with us to give the second part of his presentation on instinct and intelligence. For all those that uh, watched the first part, you see how deep and uh, profound uh, the, the teachings are and uh, how relevant to our studies of spiritism. So without further ado, I'll pass to Luis to continue his presentation. Thank you, Luis. Thank you, Joao, for, for the kind words. Uh, I have a lot of material today. I know I cut maybe 30% because of our, due to our time limitations, but I still think we have a lot of beautiful stuff here. So, but you guys will let me know later. Uh, I know that you don't usually like my, uh, uh, summaries, but I think today it is very appropriate that we use one or two slides to remember what we discussed last month. And then in the first part of our instinct and intelligence talk, uh, uh, we highlighted that intelligence is not an attribute of the vital principles. It is just a special faculty that a few classes of organic beings have. Instinct, according to spiritism, actually according to, to the spirit's book, is a non-reasoning intelligence. It is a good definition. Uh, Jesus. Uh, I start to think in English, it's tough to go Portuguese in English, but Joana de Angelis uh, shared with us that uh, according to her, existing studies on instinct are complex, and it's not a term, a key of a single meaning. Reminding you of a Freudian view of the human personal, personality, sorry, that we're going to use today. Uh, remember, we have the ego, the id, and the superego, according to Freud. And the id is the instinct. The ego is our reasoning conscious part. And the superego is related to ethical and moral concepts. So according to Freud, to Freud a healthy ego provides us the ability to adapt to the reality that surrounds us by means of intelligence. It does so that it is acceptable to the instinctive needs and to our unconscious, to our moral and ethical parts of personality. So this is a summary of the first part. Then we discuss the brain and uh, it's always important to always important to remind that intelligence needs material implements, needs the brain to express itself. But we should not confuse brain function with intelligence. Intelligence is an attribute of the spirit. You see a picture on the left, we discussed about the three kinds of brains, the reptile brain, the limbic brain where the emotions are, the neocortex, the rational brain. Anyway, but after that, or I don't remember exactly the order, but I brought to you, or I, I brought to this, uh, uh, to our talk, a uh, content from an Andre Luis book uh, that, in my view, firmly supports the concept that one of the organs that we have in our perispirit is the brain. Meaning, we have a brain in our, uh, uh, Jesus, I'm, my English is bad today, in our incarnated body, but we also have a brain in our perispirit. As we learned, and Joan, you know, did a, a talk about the organs in the perispirit. So I'm plainly convinced of that. And I think we do have support and reference from strong uh, spiritist, spiritist books regarding that. I like to think, 
and I invite you to think with me that uh, uh, if we shift a little bit, we could say that while we are incarnated and our and we are not, you know, in a situation of emancipation of the soul, we have our spirit spirit here with us, and our spirit spiritual brain is here with us. So we could think that what happens is that uh, our brain is the combination of our incarnated brain and the spiritual brain, providing us with the means for our spirits to interact with the incarnated world. I like that view. I think it's a view that's interesting for us to have. That our brain is part of the nature and it encompasses the organ that is in the perispirit. I hope that's challenging for you. And uh, yeah, the last item I already mentioned, the primitive brain, the limbic brain, and the neocortex. So let's move on. Today we have a lot of material uh, essentially on two topics, but we will start with the historical development of the human intelligence, because I think it provides us uh, uh, with interesting analysis and, and possibilities of understanding things. Uh, material from the Brazilian Spiritist Federation tells, it, uh, tells us that the development of human intelligence is clearly delineated with the humanization of the intelligence principle, something that occur, occur, occurred gradually over the millennia. We're going to see that this millennia, we could think of uh, hundreds of millennia. Along with the conquests of intelligence comes free will, a condition that transforms the human into the builder of its own, of his own destiny, or its own destiny from there. Uh, hello, Carol, good to see you here. From the earliest times, human intelligence has been broadening by the acquisitions obtained in the innumerable reincarnations of the spirit and in its stages on the spiritual plane. Uh, I am reading the slides because I know there's people there who does not have the image. So the essence here is that we have been improving as humans through the millennia both while we incarnated and while uh, uh, we were in the spiritual plane, broadening our intelligence and our capabilities is according to a spiritist doctrine. And yes. then we, yes. Oh, good morning. Do you want us to, I'm sorry, I was a little bit late. Do you want us to uh, interrupt for questions or say for the end? It's up to you, but I have a lot of material. No, it's up to, to you. So. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll leave to the end then. Okay, Elmo. Anyway, uh, uh, Emmanuel Luis, in Between Heaven and Earth, uh, tells us that just as the perfect physical vehicle of man was born from the primary forms of nature, the spiritual body was also initiated into the rudimentary principles of intelligence. Primitive humans have spent centuries and centuries to become rarefied using multiple forms in order to conquer superior qualities that in subutilizing their organization will confer them new possibilities of conscientious growth. Wow. Instinct and intelligence gradually transform into knowledge and responsibility. And similar renewal gives the being more advanced manifestation equipment. Uh, we see that in the Louis here essentially uh, what I'm is a citing a, a text that confirms that. Uh, let's go a bit towards scientific stuff. Anthropology indicates that human beings uh, 
belong to the group of mammals called primates, which currently have more than 330 species, like lemurs, monkeys, and the great apes. Uh, we humans, according to science, derive anthropology actually, derive from an evolutionary branch of a group of apes, which occurred about five or six million years ago in Africa. Those of you who are seeing the image, uh, this would be that group and oh, it's not seeable. I don't see that. So for some reason, my mouse does not show. Anyway, top line towards the left is us evolving. And the new hominids that, you know, derived from the group of apes had unique characteristics, reduced canines and bipedalism. The first of this group that we could point out would be the Australopithecus. Uh, Robert Winston in Human Instinct, it, it's a book that we used in the first part, on the first part already, tells us that the uprighting of the spine and the bipedal correct ability were fundamental aspects of anatomy that made such ancestors superior to apes. It is believed that such characteristics have appeared somewhere between 4.2 to 2.5 million years ago in the Australopithecus. There's an image on the left, uh, arbitrarily saying 3 million years ago. It shows that the Australopithecus had around 1.2, 1.3 meters average height, so they were fairly smaller than the current humans. Continuous Winston. What made primitive humans walk on two legs instead of four? Whatever the exact sequence of events that led our ancestors to walk on two legs, we know that the upright posture was fundamental to the survival and success of the species. For hominids, another really important thing came with the practice of walking on two legs. Standing upright means having their hands free. We spiritists could think of interesting reasons why primitive women change of posture. And I think it's not, it's totally uh, acceptable uh, that there was a spiritual influence for this to happen with all the knowledge that we know about the spiritual influence in Earth, solar system, the universe as a whole. So uh, I, I would say that a decision was made for, for this path to start to happen. In Genesis chapter 11, it is 14 and 15. By the way, this is the 2003 edition. Kardec tells us that the body is simply an envelope to receive the spirit. Consequently, its origin and the materials of which it is composed matter little. Continues Kardec. From the similitude which exists between body of man and that of the monkey, certain physiologists have contended that the former was only a transformation of the latter. In that, there's nothing impossible, nor, if so, does it affect the dignity of man. You will see some things highlighted in, in red, is because this particular edition of the Genesis in English has some mistranslations and this is one of those. So if you guys have the book with you, just make a note. Continuous Kardec. Bodies of monkeys may have served very well for the vestment 
of the first human spirits necessarily undeveloped who have been incarnated upon earth these garments being more appropriate to their needs and for the exercise of their faculties than the bodies of any other animal instead of a special robe being made for the spirits he found a ready-made one such an origin of the body is not prejudicial prejudicial to the spirit so here kardec clearly tells us that somewhere along the development of the human even while the human was not what we call humans today uh, spirits were incarnated or being incarnated when did this happen i don't know uh, i couldn't find a reference if you're talking about five hundred thousand years or two million years ago to 40,000 years, but I, I don't have any reference or information told us by the spirits regarding this. I, I got a message here, bad internet. I hope it does not affect you. Uh, we don't know if those spirits that were incarnating in the primitive humans, were they those spirits? Were they spirits from other planets that came here to bootstrap our development? That's an interesting question. We know that this has happened uh, three, four, five, six thousand years before Christ, but I couldn't find a reference uh, sustaining that uh, spirits from different planets came to uh, uh, incarnate in our primitive humans before that. If you guys have them, please share with us, Jerome, Elmo, and others. Moving on, in evolutionary terms, it is assumed that a million years after the uprising of the spine, Australopithecus evolved into what we call the genus Homo, the lineage that led to the current human species, the Homo sapiens sapiens. This evolution gave the primitive human exceptional abilities, such as carrying its own small children, carrying objects, carrying food, harvesting and transporting fruits and vegetables and building and using tools. The genus Homo reveals an outstanding flourishing of intelligence. Although there is no scientific humanity as to how this has occurred. It, this comes from a text by uh, uh, UNESP on human evolution and its social cultural aspects. Were this an spiritist text, we probably could say that, well, we have a good idea on how this flourishing intelligence might have happened, wouldn't we? From the same test from the University of Sao Paulo, there's no consensus on the explanation for the development of mental abilities of members of this group. A number of scientists claim that this development was due to the manufacture and use of tools. Others say that it's also due to the variation in diet provided by the use of tools. Root, tubers, meat. Again, I believe we spiritists could give you know a, a few good ideas on the development of mental abilities of this group. For us, we what we know, it would be very reasonable to assume that this came from the spiritual world. 
Allan Kardec in Genesis, same chapter as before, he tells us that the body is at the same time the envelope and the instrument, the instrument, sorry, of the spirit. And as the latter acquires new aptitudes, it is reinvested with an appropriate envelope for the new kind of work which it must accomplish. Continues Kardec, in order to be more exact, it is necessary to say that it is the spirit itself which fashions its envelope and appropriates it to its new needs. It brings it toward perfection, develops and completes the organism by measure as it experiences the need of manifesting new qualities. In a word, it makes it, it makes his physical body in accordance with his intelligence. It's clear for us that the vision that Kardec is projecting towards us is that the evolution of the human along the ages has happened directed by the spirit that was inhabited, that inhabiting that incarnated body. And as we as a spirit develop our intelligence and capability, we directed our body to change. That's an interesting view. I like it. And it's very coherent with scientific vision. Going back to the text from uh, Sao Paulo University, about 1.5 or 1.8 million years ago, a remarkable important event occurred with Homo erectus. The discovery, control, and use of fire. Definitely the fire was a dividing uh, uh, element in the story of human development. Such conquest made primitive men develop safer and more comfortable ways of survival, building shelters to protect against cold and animal attacks, working wood to build dwellings, traps to capture animals, cooking meat and other food, facilitating digestion and absorption of nutrients. how this has happened. Uh, I, I, I make this parenthesis here because I find it very interesting. There is a scientific proposition called intelligence design. It's, by the way, it's now religious. Uh, this is one of the books, probably one of the first books by Paxton and others, uh, uh, The Mystery of Life's Origin. But the argument here is this. The evolutionary changes that have occurred on Earth, not only uh, uh, in human development, have happened at a speed that would not be possible by the mere process of spontaneous mutation and natural selection. Uh, we all know about uh, uh, Darwin's natural selection. We see it happening around us. Uh, probably we all study that uh, darker butterflies in, in areas with dark tree uh, uh, trunks have a, a better chance of survival than clear butterflies, so they predominate. Uh, it's accepted by almost all uh, uh, groups that natural selection exists and happens. The thing is, a group of scientists is questioning using actual uh, statistical data if much more complex 
changes in biological beings could you know, happen just by natural selection. And a number of those academics have actually uh, uh, proven by calculation that uh, uh, certain species, just like us humans, change too much along a short period of time for that to be able to be, you know, a mere case of chance, a mere case of mutation that is uh, uh, selected by living conditions. So what they say is, well, some sort of interference has to have happened for those changes to, you know, to have occurred so fast. And that's essentially the proposition called intelligence design. And I think that's very, very intriguing. We spiritists, you know, would have a, a list of possible explanations for that. But the truth is, there is a lot of prejudice against this movement in the academic environment because they qualify it as creationists associated to religion, non scientific, etc. But I find it very, very intriguing. It's one of those things that I believe will eventually be accepted because. Uh, uh, it makes a lot of sense to, you know, incarnated science for us spirits is almost, uh, um, although not reported by uh, uh, any reference that I have, it, it's a consequence, an obvious consequence of everything that we learn. But we go on. The Amos Erectus also developed language, oh boy. Language was another breakthrough of the Amos Erectus. Not only fire, but language. Language allows us unlimited communications about all aspects of reality, concrete and abstract, present and absent. We can be, we are, we become able to talk about the past, and the future. Almost, uh, I've, I've heard of one tribe in South America, I don't remember where, that did not have uh, the concept of time, of, of uh, verbal, not only verbal, but of the changing of time. Every other group of humans around the globe uh, were able to, every other group was able to uh, uh, create the concept of present, past, sometimes future, and discuss abstract things, something that has happened, something that will happen. According to Robert Winston, this allowed, you know, for the reinvention of the cultural, of the cultural world, extending beyond the direct physical experience of the here and now. It's easy to see it as a breakthrough, isn't it? Through language, man learns to communicate, to send warning signals, and to exchange learning. Uh, there seem to be other species that are able to exchange learning. For instance, uh, uh, today, scientists believe that the orcas, those, those whales, uh, they somehow are able to teach their uh, uh, children different hunting techniques to actually develop the new way to hunt and to teach to their, to their uh, uh, offspring. But this is very rare and definitely uh, doesn't seem to, to be symbolic. It's probably by example. Eva Jablonka and Marlon Land in Evolution in Four Dimensions, we have used this work before as well, tells us that the distinguishing factor of human beings is our ability to think and communicate through words and other symbols. Symbols 
are a diagnostic trait of human beings. It seems that in our globe, only as humans use symbols. Rationality, linguistic ability, artistic skill, and religiosity are facets of symbolic thought and communication. So we have been evolving. Again, I remember this is not chicken soup. This is hard steak. We have to cut and swallow it. it during our involvement evolve, as humans, directed yeah, by the spiritual world, we have been developing intelligence and skills, and we have been shaping our incarnated bodies to better use those skills you have been developing. And eventually that into symbolic thoughts and our ability to teach things to one another. This learning process, human learning, is an integrated process that causes qualitative transformation in the mental structure of the learner. Intelligent intellect, intellect and intelligence, they transform. Human learning is different from that which takes place in animals. Because in humans, we observe willingness or intent to learn, such as you're listening to this odd guy, you know, sharing things with you. Persistent dynamism in the search of new information and creativity in using methods that enhance one's knowledge. This comes from Eva Jablonka. Human learning can be broadly understood as the acquisition of new knowledge through the development of skills, resulting in changes in behavior. Social learning, that part of learning that had to do with social interchange, has been a remarkable evolutionary factor in humans. It's a change in behavior that results from social interactions with other individuals. In incarnated humans, I would say that uh, uh, our search for involvement as spirits, while incarnated, could be easily identified with social learning. That's something that has happened you know, to us as spirits and that we have been perfecting and incorporating along the ages. It is fantastic that we are being able to do this here, incarnated, talking to each other, exchanging information and trying to become, you know, better, better humans. Uh, a parenthesis, I, I removed most of it, but uh, I, I couldn't, you know, not mention Piaget. This guy at your left is Jean Piaget, probably one of the greatest exponents of the study of learning. He, came, he, he presented very innovative concepts. Uh, he studied reason deeply, how we learn. Uh, I would say that Many of the current pedagogic schools derive from, from Piaget. My mother loves Piaget. She studied him. If Paco were here, I'm sure you would have something to say about Piaget. Uh, in his work, just to mention a few words by him, uh, Biology and Knowledge, Chapter 5, Piaget shares with us that he believes there are three major kinds of knowledge the hereditary forms of which instinct is the prototype whose content refers to innate information. The logical mathematical forms that we have been progressively building that happens in relatively higher levels that characterize intelligence. We need higher levels of our seek. And third, 
the forms acquired as a result of experience. That's Piaget's view of knowledge. Now that we have talked about, uh, we have discussed the evolution of the human species, the acquiring of skills, a few parentheses, uh, then we began to be able to learn to exchange knowledge, use intelligence for that. But we also have knowledge that's not a result of intelligence, that's instinctive knowledge. Let's go about human intelligence. Going back to Tabor Davis and Tiber's psychopathical medical, psychopathic, sorry, medical dictionary, Tabor tells us that for medicine, intelligence is the ability to understand and make relationships, to solve problems, to adjust to new situations. That's probably the fifth or sixth or seventh definition of intelligence that we have discussed it anyway. We must point out that intelligence is not the same as intellect. They are related concepts but they are not synonyms. Intellect is the faculty of thinking and acquiring knowledge. Trying to break that down. Intellect is translated as the possibility of knowing, the possibility of understanding and learning, always enabled by intelligence. A primitive human, for instance, is considered or might be considered to be intelligence, but he's not intellectualized as his knowledge is scarce. In contrast, the intelligence of the genius has a high degree of intellectuality from the accumulated knowledge, possibly through countless reincarnation experiences. So intelligence is, to, is the means for us to become more intellectualized, to gather more knowledge. The picture, you know, this kid many, many times reincarnated and knows a lot of stuff. is very, very intellectualized. According to the material from Brazilian Spiritist Federation, intelligence and intellect evolve gradually like everything in nature. Intelligence, properly speaking, begins when the being starts to emit continuous thought. Begins with the humanization of the intelligence principle, the intelligence principle, sorry. Uh, I don't have a good definition for continuous thought, but I I reproduce it here because it was the best reference and could find. Intellectual capacity develops with the acquisition of knowledge. Alain Kardec tells us in the Spirit's book, the Spiritist's book, chapter nine, that God has created our spirits equal but each of them has lived over a longer or shorter amount of time and has consequently developed more or less aptitude. The difference lies in the degree of experience and volition and eagerness. The difference lies in their free will, by which some advance more rapidly than others. So, as learning varies in individuals, the evolutionary positions will be different, obviously. And the codification explains this very, very clearly. Joana de Angelis, uh, in a book called The Conscious Being, I don't think this book has been translated to English, no. She tells us that the thinking, the thinking creature is still an incomplete being. 
in a constant process of improvement, of transformation, in a prolonged effort to develop the psychophysical, parapsychological, and mediumistic potentials in it in latency. The evolution process is incessant, and the changes, the transformations are continuous. Uh, I made a point to place this picture for those who are who do not have the image. It, it, it's a bronze image that I, you probably have seen somewhere by Hodan called the Tinker. It's a guy thinking. That's us, huh? Thinking. And you guys are thinking, what the hell is Louise telling us? Anyway, I hope I'll be able to tie it in the end. The Conscious Being was just published by Leo Publisher in English, just re released. I didn't know. That's good. Yeah. One more book for you guys to read in English. For philosophy, here goes one more definition. Intelligence obtained a scientific consensus from the thought of René Descartes, again Descartes, for whom Human intelligence should be considered as the ability to reason based on memory. So for Descartes, intelligence is the ability to reason based on memory. So intelligence is seen as a synonymous of cognition that later Jean Piaget defined as a logical mathematical function of our personality of our brain if i might say so you know you use the word spirit those two concepts by descartes and piaget uh, generated some conclusions uh, that resulted in a lot of <coughs> repercussions some wrong some classically run, uh, uh, but among them, and this is one that I want to point out. Well, if intelligence is that, it is possible to measure human intelligence and classify intelligence on a scale that was initially called intelligence coefficient. So we would be able to, to grade intelligence and to compare intelligence. And this idea about the notion that eventually became what is still today called the IQ, the intelligence quotient, something that we can measure and allow us to, or would allow us to uh, classify humans according to their intelligence it was later found however that iq tests only measured cognitive ability and even while measuring cognitive ability it does in a very generalized way so iq tests should not be considered in isolation. They should not be considered as a good measure of intelligence. Unfortunately, it still will today in some sense, not as much as before, but it's a very, very incomplete way to try to measure and compare, and compare sorry, intelligence among humans. But it reflects something that could be our cognitive ability. It is known today that intelligence is not a compact, rigid, and indissoluble unit which represents the altar of reason, as it was imagined. This comes from the Brazilian Spiritist Federation, and I, uh, I reproduce it here word by word because it's such a pompous phrase. Intelligence is a set of capabilities that go beyond logical, mathematical reasoning, and this is important. Intelligence is developed 
in the spiritual being by means of a stimuli along the existence developed in successive reincarnations. This is the spirit of Dio, the spiritist spirit. We as humans have an intelligence. It has been under development as we evolve through the ages and will be continuously de developed further on, depending on if of each of us, each of us and our capacity of using our free will to become better, more capable, more intelligent with a better intellect. You are doing this today, by the way. Going back to Descartes, his vision of intelligence as the human capacity to reason has been propagated until today. This guy, by the way, that's an image of Descartes. I don't know where it came from. I, didn't, I don't remember, sorry. There is his famous phrase, ego cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. In Portuguese, penso, portanto, existo. However relevant the contributions of Descartes, only one aspect has been focused by them. Rational intelligence, also known as mathematical and logical intelligence, or formal logical thinking. That's a part of intelligence. You might even say that's a small part of intelligence. Rational intelligence uses reasoning and reason in decision-making in order to solve problems or challenges. And that works pretty well with brothers here. But in this situation, our rational minds work towards an adequate solution, actually without involvement or with a reduced participation of emotions and feelings. The point being that just rational intelligence does not apply well to all sorts of problem solving or challenges or human challenges that we do every day around it. Uh, the Brazilian Spirits Federation recommends to us that reason must not contradict emotions and feelings. And it tells us, listen, the ethical conflicts that occur or that might occur, you know, with us when choosing a path are a sign that something is not right or might not be right in the moral field. Thus, we should, in any rational decision, necessarily weight the moral consequences. You know, trying to reconcile what reason tells us and what our feelings and emotion, inspiration tells us to try to guarantee the peace of the spirit. That's obviously an essential factor in life. That's interesting, isn't it? Let's talk about intelligence dimensions. Oh boy. So uh, uh, mathematical reasoning is not the only reason, not the only kind of reason, any kind of intelligence. What are the others? I'm getting very close to us already. In the 60s or 70s, or I'd say the 70s, this gentleman on the left, Howard Gardner, is a cognitive psychologist at Harvard University. He developed a theory of multiple intelligence. And in his book, Multiple Intelligences, he tells us that in a traditional view, 
intelligence is operationally defined as the ability to respond to intelligent items, to intelligence items. His theory of multiple intelligences just pluralize this traditional concept. Now, an intelligence, a kind of intelligence, implies in the ability to solve problems or develop products that are important in a given environment or social community. The ability to solve problems allows the person to address a situation in which a goal must be achieved and locate the appropriate route to that goal. So, by identifying those environments and those goals and the characteristics using a statistical way that is not that interesting to us here, he came up with seven, later eight, dimensions of intelligence. What would they be? They would be spatial intelligence, musical, musical intelligence, verbal intelligence, logical, mathematical, interpersonal, intrapersonal, body or kinesthetic, kinesthetic, sorry, intelligence. And later he added naturalistic intelligence. I had a number of slides here, but I'll resume in just one. For those who do not have the image, I'm showing just a graph that has the eight types of intelligence related by Gardner uh, with a catch kind of smartness and the, uh, the roles, let's say, that people in society have in, in which this particular kind of intelligence uh, is a differential, is present or is present in a high degree. So for instance, bodily kinesthetic intelligence would be persons who are body smart. You typically see that in dancers, in actors, in athletes. Logical mathematics has to do with being number smart. You see it in like scientists, accountants, engineers. Linguistic intelligence is being word smart. You see it in writers, presenters, lawyers, comedians. Naturalistic intelligence has to do with being nature smart. You see it in gardeners veterinarian, farmer. Musical intelligence, that's easy. Is being music smart, is hitting singers, in musicians, in composers. Spatial intelligence is being picture smart. You see it in architects, in artists, photographers, pilots. Interpersonal intelligence, people smart teachers, doctors, politicians, salesperson. Intrapersonal intelligence is being self-smart. You see it in writers who are able to introspect it, in philosophers, in researchers. Obviously, all that is combined. So the idea here is to sell to you that our intelligence is not limited to logical mathematical. We have a lot of other characteristics that are intelligence, that are part of intelligence, and are not measured by IQ. Very, very difficult to compare. Very, very difficult to place a finger. Then probably Eric was gonna ask me. We hear so much about emotional intelligence. It's not one of those. The concept of emotional intelligence, I'm pretty sure you have heard about, was popularized by an American journalist, not a scientist, uh, a psychologist named Daniel Goldman. 
1995. Uh, his point is that although we see emotional intelligence in the concept of intrapersonal interpersonal proposed by, Gar by Gardner, he believes that there is a vast uh, a field that was not part of Gardner mapping. So in his words, and by the way, this on the left is the cover of his book. Uh, I have this book in English. This is the 10th anniversary edition. It has a, a, an interesting prefix. Anyway, uh, he tells us, there is one dimension of personal intelligence that is broadly pointed to, but little explored in Gardner's elaboration, the role of emotion. Perhaps this is so because as Gardner suggested to me, he actually interviewed Gardner, this Daniel Goldman. Gardner's work is so strongly informed by a cognitive science model of mind that his view of intelligence emphasizes cognition even when he mentions abilities that are not logical mathematical he's always focused on cognition on reasoning on intelligence based on reasoning and uh, uh, going back to golden words the understanding of oneself and of others in motive in habits of working and in putting that inside into use in conducting one's own life and getting along with others. The realm of emotions extends beyond the reach of language and cognition. So essentially, this is the thesis that Daniel Golan brings to us with emotional intelligence. There's a kind of intelligence that's not cognitive. It goes beyond language and cognition. And he continues, while there is ample room in Gardner's description, Gardner and those who work with him have not pursued in great detail the role of feeling in this intelligence, focusing on cognitions about feelings. This leaves an unexplored and rich sea of emotions that makes the inner life and relationship so complex, so compelling, and so often puzzling. About this, Joana de Angelis has something to say. This comes from the book, uh, Personal Triumph, that I believe has nothing, not been being translated uh, uh, to English, and I forgot to put the number of the chapters. I oh, know the chapter the thinking being, sorry, that is not numbered. Item intelligence. And take note, this was written in 2001. Okay, we'll use this date later. Joana de Angeli tells us that the intellectual quotient, the IQ, prevail. She means the uh, uh, mathematical, logical reason, the cognitive view of intelligence until the moment when another form another expression of one's intelligence was detected uh, probably has been detected to be better english it's most my translation which became known as emotional intelligence one that allows the perception and understanding of one's own feelings as well as those of other people continues Joanna. Thanks to this achievement and understanding of values, human beings have become more enriched through the development of their EQ, of their emotional quotient, developing dormant resources and aptitudes that give them amplitude for human and social relationships as well as for the balance of emotions and for the success in the endeavors undertaken. 
So what we have learned here is that there is a non-cognitive kind of intelligence. And as Joanna shares with us, it helps us balance emotions when we go on, you know, with our endeavors. We already learned that emotions come from the emotional brain and come from the uh, uh, unconscious part of our thinking. So it's an essential element in the composition of our being. And by understanding that it's there, it helps us to develop it and to balance it here. You see, we are keep telling the same thing using different inputs, converging spirit, spirit is thinking with conventional science thinking. Yes, you have seen this slide, but later, a nine kind of intelligence has been proposed, the spiritual intelligence. What would be it? Existentialist or spiritual intelligence would be a nine, a neat kind of cognitive intelligence related to the ability to consider deeper questions of existence, to reflect on who we are, where we come from, why we die, where we are going. Spiritual intelligence. Gardner. Is it still, he's still alive, by the way, guys. Is it still reluctant to accept this intelligence? He justifies it, saying that scientists have not yet proven that it acts or requires the specific areas of the brain. We'll see to that. There's a gentleman called Robert Amos. He's a neuropsychologist from the University of California. He is a sort of religious guy. He's known for his investigation into psychoneurology and religions. And I'm citing here, uh, not work by Amos, but a work published in a magazine by uh, uh, Catholic University in Sao Paulo by, I don't have the authors here. Uh, about the debate between Gardner and Amos. Amos, Amos. They say, Amos make a strong case that intelligence has a spiritual side. It is an existential involvement, involvement, sorry, full of meaning and value. For Amos, this form of intelligence enables human beings to establish intimate contact, not only with what religions call divine, but with themselves and with the world and facts of life. Finding this a form of cognitive achievement that deserves the adjective of spiritual. That's an interesting point, huh? Let's go uh, and see how this idea is supported by others. There is an Austrian author called Viktor Frankl. Uh, João told me uh, a few weeks ago that um, Divaldo occasionally mentions, mentions Frankl in, in his uh, talks. He's not a spiritist, Viktor Frankl. He's a uh, uh, I don't know if it's a scientist or researcher. Anyway, uh, Viktor Frankl added ideas. Uh, he called a spiritual intelligence noetic. Guys, noetic is just a synonym, a synonym for spiritual. This comes, by the way, from Achilles Coelho and Miguel Mafu that wrote an article on the, the Psychological Journal of Sao Paulo University. 
called the spiritual and religious dimensions of human experience, distinctions and interrelations in Viktor Frankl's work. So it's essentially an article about the work of this gentleman. And they tell us, humans and animals consist of a biological dimension, a psychological dimension and a social dimension. However, humans differ from them because the noetic dimension is part of their being. So we have an additional dimension to the animals. At no time do humans leave the other dimensions, but the, the essence of their existence is in the spiritual dimension. Oh boy, this could come from a spiritual uh, uh, book of some kind. He continues, or Achilles continues, Achilles and Miguel. The spiritual dimension shows itself as the dimension of the experience of freedom and responsibility. Responsibility is not identified with the moralistic character by which the individual would be obliged to act in accordance with interjected norms, but it is characterized precisely by the ability to respond Bond, that is by the acting freedom at the time when a person responds or positions himself in front of present circumstances. So what uh, Franco is saying is that spiritual intelligence has to do with free will, in short. Continues Achilles, presupposes freedom to effect its positioning in the world, in its spiritual dimension, it is to speak above all of being responsible and of the human being aware of his responsibility. It's not freedom from biological, psychological, or social conditions. It's not, you know, being J or not, to which every man is subject but freedom to take a stand in the face of all circumstances, being them everyday circumstances or exceptional circumstances. Franco clearly evolved on the concept. And let's bring you a more, even more recent author. Uh, Dana Zola, she's uh, a, a, uh, a physicist, an American physicist and philosopher uh, whose husband is a psychiatrist, Ian Marshall, and they wrote a book called The Spiritual Intelligence, The Ultimate Intelligence. So we are seeing the concept of spiritual intelligence evolving. This book, by the way, has been published on 2000, on the turn of the century, in its first edition. In Portuguese, it was translated only on 2013. My quotes here come from the original first edition in English. Just give you an appetite, or uh, aperitif, how do you say that? A sneak preview? No, that's not the word I was looking for. Anyway, in this work, the author cites research by University of California in 1997. If anyone wants the author, uh, I'll send you. On the existence in the human brain of something she calls a God spot, an area in our brain that would be responsible for the needs, the processing of spiritual experience. So tells us Dana Zohar and Ian Marshall. This built-in spiritual center, and by the way, that's the way it's written in the English in, in the original, not center, but center. Center. But I believe that's the English. Anyway, this built-in spiritual center is located among neural connections in the temporal lobes of the brain. On PET scans, these neural areas, these neural areas light up whenever research subjects, whenever the guys being subjected to PET scans, 
are exposed to discussion of a spiritual or religion topic. Isn't that interesting? And continues Dana on the more general concept of the spiritual intelligence. He tells us, at the early part of the 20th century, the IQ, the intelligent quotient, became the big issue. The higher a person IQ, the theory of Quant, the higher their intelligence. In the mid-90s, Daniel Goldman popularized research showing, showing that emotional intelligence, EQ, is of equal importance. At the end of the 20th century, an array of recent but so far undigested scientific data shows, uh, show us that there is a third Q, the S Q, the spiritual quotient. By the way, she used as Q obviously as a synonym of spiritual intelligence, not as a result of a test. Something to bring attention, you know, from people. She continues, as Q, spiritual intelligence, gives us the ability to choose. It gives us our moral sense an ability to temper rigid rules with understanding and compassion, and an equal ability to see when compassion and understanding have their limits. We use as skill to wrestle with questions of good and evil. We use it to envision and realize possibilities, to dream, to aspire, to raise ourselves out of the mud, her word. It is in its transformative power, transformative power, that SQ differs mainly from EQ, from the spiritual intelligence differs mainly from uh, emotional intelligence. SQ has no necessary connection, connection to religion. Conventional religion is an externally imposed set of rules and beliefs. The spiritual intelligence, as described in this book, is an internal ability of the human brain and psyche, understand spirit, a facility developed over millions of years reincarnations that allows the brain to find and use meaning in the solution of problems. The spiritual intelligence is the soul's intelligence with which we make ourselves whole. This lady on the photo at the left is, is Dana Zohar. She tells us that a person high in spiritual intelligence is likely to be a servant leader, someone who is responsible for bringing higher vision and value to others and showing them how to use it. In other words, a person who inspires others. Uh, her words again, I'm gonna say now, I, I couldn't resist of placing it here. About her book, she says that this book finishes with a chapter, how to be spiritually intelligent in a spiritually dumb culture, her words. So maybe it makes you curious to read it. And a last paragraph from her. Through a more cultivated use of our spiritual intelligence and through the personal honesty and courage that such cultivation requires, we can reconnect with the deeper sources and deeper meanings within ourselves. And we can use that reconnection to serve causes and processes much larger than ourselves. Joanna de Angelis has something to say about this. In that same book, Personal Triumph, uh, the same chapter, The Thinking Being, she tells us. The discovery and verification of spiritual intelligence at this time 
provides an understanding of the complexity of the human soul. Analyzing the data provided by thought and developing the programs most compatible with its needs and aspirations in the complex movement of the search for fullness. This book was published in 2001. She continues, the areas in the brain in which the different intelligences are exteriorized are perfectly identifiable. But there is, however, a prominent light point that expresses in the brain the existence of that area of spiritual nature, propelling the being to the understanding of its transcendence and of its destiny towards infinity. This is my translation from the Portuguese. I try to be very precise. I have to tell you that I looked all over for a PET scan image showing uh, the, the God spots. I found many, but none reliable, and it's been badly used in some religious movements. So I'd rather not show something I'm not uh, perfectly convinced that it's proper. Anyway, Joana de Angelis tells us in 2001, remember, Dona Zohar book was published in 2000, was translated to parts in 2013. Uh, the research of this came along in 1997. So we're talking things that are very, very, very synchronic. So the list continues. This light point or divine point is situated between the connections, between the connections of neurons in the temporal lobes of the brain. It's not the pineal gland, okay? It's, a, it's an area of activity in uh, the center of the temporal lobe. Uh, let me take off my, okay. Research carried out through the use of positrons allows us to verify that in discussions of a religious or a spiritual nature, sorry, whenever the theme is about God and the spirit, the transcendent life and the values of the soul, an illumination in the referred place immediately takes place, demonstrating that this is where the spiritual intelligence is based, the parts of the brain that are activated. By the way, the original in Portuguese says positron. Finalizing her thoughts, is this therefore this intelligence that leads to the heart of things and facilitates the understanding of the abstract, particularly when referring to the values of immortality of the soul, religious faith, universal causality, godness, love. Uh, next to this is the third to last slide, my slide. Just try to tie together everything. Remember, we began last month trying to define intellect, sorry, try to define intelligence, instinct, different points of view. We understood that instinct is something not reasoned upon, it's something in our unconscious that we have to control. We learned about the evolution of humanity, uh, how we have been adapting our bodies to our needs and how we have been evolving in intelligence and intellect. We discussed the brain, how we have a brain that has been built like a castle with different stages and different levels. We studied Freud that shows in, in his conceptuation how, you know, our ego is constantly trying to adapt our uh, uh, instincts and our ethical and moral 
starts in the superego and compacts below is that. We saw intelligence that first we thought it was just rational reasoning. But I believe I have showed to you that it has multiple dimensions. Not only the cognitive intelligence here represented by IQ that we can divide in, in eight kinds of cognitive intelligences, but also emotional intelligence that's our non reasoning intelligence and spiritual intelligence, the spiritual intelligence that would be the part of our intelligence that is able or that is involved that we are dealing with the concepts we do in spiritist meaning understanding where we come from, where we go to, what are ever spirits, etc. And how all that composes our intelligence. And that our spirit counts on that and our free will. And we know the mechanics now, I hope you do, and you know the theories and you know uh, what has been told to us by the spirits in our route towards evolution, towards improved, uh, improving ourselves. And we are in a very lower steps of, of this particular march. Anyway, uh, uh, what did I write here? That the multiple dimension, dimensions of our intelligence provides us with multiple capabilities in variable degrees developed along the ages of reincarnation. We are allowed to learn, to learn and evolve with free will, using and developing such capabilities. Thus, it's up to each of us. And I will finish, and I still have time, Joel, don't look badly at me. With Emmanuel's point of view regarding the intelligent human. So Emmanuel, uh, in his book, the spirit, in the book, Spirit's Religion, chapter 36, tells us about the intelligent human. And uh, I, I have to point out 30 seconds. Uh, Jussara, the other day in her brilliant uh, talk about a different subject, brought out this book. And this book is so interesting because uh, it, it was written as a reconstitution of a number of spirit sections, actually the end of some medianistic meetings around 1959, uh, where at the end, the spirit Emmanuel interacted with the present through a medium, of course, to discuss subjects. I, memory does not fail me. It's a collection of like 60 or 90 or whatever. Anyway, uh, can you imagine being there, interacting with Emmanuel? I am sure that must have been so interesting. Anyway, the spiritual Emmanuel tells us, in fact, the intelligent human is not the one who only calculates, but the one who transfuses his own reasoning into emotion to understand life and sublimate it. Being able to master the riches of the world, the intelligent human abstain from excesses to live simply without disrespecting the needs of others. Keeping superior knowledge the intelligent human does not hide himself in pride, but approaches the ignorance to help him instruct himself. This is my translation. I couldn't find a better word than ignorant. He continues, having the means to make others a slave to his interest, he works spontaneously for the pleasure of serving. And hoarding unassailable virtues, he does not shy away from living 
with the victims of evil, acting without derision or condemnation to free them from vice. And with this advice of Emmanuel on where we should go, I end this presentation. I hope you have enjoyed. Thank you. Thank you, Luis. Really, really excellent. Um, we have time for quick questions. Um, anyone yes, has a question here? We're saying this. <laughs> Arlene was really positive, I think. Um, you know, I, if no one, I, I have a, a common question slash question going back to to that one slide uh, that you brought on the, oh man, other words escaped me, uh, on the creationists and the evolutionists, right? Uh, that I think it's a, it's a very interesting subject that uh, especially as spiritists, we need to explore further, right? Because it's been uh, such a, a clear division, science on one side against it and, uh, and uh, religion in the other side, defending creationism, especially some, uh, some um, more religious, uh, uh, fanatical religions uh, here, right? How do you see this uh, evolving? How do, we, how do you think we are going to get out of the dichotomy of uh, yes or no to a more reasonable way of finding uh, the, the, the truth? Well, uh, you guys know that, uh, in, in my opinion, things are what they are, and we cannot do anything about it. So nature is what it is. What we, we should be is not mystic about it, as Spiritist teaches us. And, you know, uh, learn about it layer by layer. Specifically regarding those excesses, uh, I, I wish I had a very good answer to that, but I believe there will always be, always be dissent, even to the obvious things. I mean, we see, you know, flat earthers. Is that how you say in English, fat earthers? Yes. Uh, still today, I, I would love to have you know a, a, a plane trip to one of those guys. It would be great to, to hear what they say about it. Anyway, even with satellites and space stations and airplanes and uh, uh, flights like uh, Origins and whatever that if you were rich, would be able to go to the space, there's still people who think that the world is flat. So I believe there will always be dissent. What I like uh, uh, is when I see this convergence, uh, uh, when I see scientific guys talking about uh, uh, intelligent design, accepting that some interference has to, has to to, you know, to have been present because if it was not here, evolution would not uh, have time to have happened as it happened. This is fantastic because it represents, you know, new knowledge, openness of mind, conversion. And the more we talk about it, uh, uh, the more it moves. Oh, well, I, I don't think I answered you, but what is I meant to do? Yeah, I don't know. I don't think we have an answer, right? I think uh, we have to see how it evolves. But guys, we are here among friends. Did you enjoy this subject? Was it okay? Uh, not interesting? Uh, Absolutely. Excellent. Thank you, Luis. Because yeah. uh, uh, this comes from material that I have prepared on advanced spiritual teaching. One of the essential concepts behind this number of classes, and I, I have, you know, I, I think I did one or two with you guys, is to look at this convergence 
and, and both sides, the spiritist side and the conventional side, side conventional science side uh, uh, regarding subjects, including instinct and intelligence. So uh, although it might not be interesting to some of you, uh, I find it extremely appealing because it gives us instrument to discuss with non-spiritists, to build our own concepts, to uh, uh, grade and evaluate what we read and what people tell us. Tells us. So I love it. Yeah, I fully agree, Luis. And um, okay. go ahead, Elmo. Yeah, um, Luis, I really enjoyed it a lot. It's my my top quote that I like to read is anthropology. I'm really fond of anthropology, physical and cultural. And you make a comment that I was thinking of it, that the beauty of this lecture, of this presentation, is that this can be presented anywhere to any group of individuals who are willing to appreciate the topic, regardless of religion of, of religiosity or spirituality. It's, it's open and it does not, it's not limited at all. It's so open to anyone to enjoy that. I'd really like that anyone could come in completely related to spiritism, spirituality, religion, anything like that. And to go to the question or the comment of João, I think your presentation brings tremendous amount of hope in, in elimination or minimization of this duality that we confront right now that Jean was expressing and that is so obvious right now that it's, we've, since we've become so polarized on the two extremes. But your presentation itself defies that because it shows an approximation of science and spirituality, not religion, spirituality. And, and I think you see the progress over there of this exercise of trying to understand intelligence being purely for the material, ex exploring the more abstract, going to the emotional and now into the spiritual. It's a very optimistic sign that is, that we, we have no choice, but progress is gonna lead us towards the center and leaving the, 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 the polarization and move together towards the center. Thank you for your kind words. You had a question somewhere in the beginning of the presentation. Did you remember what was it? Uh, you went along the way, it, it, it dissipated. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, before we uh, we finish, uh, Luis, I know you have another very interesting le uh, lecture that you finished your course with, which is on matter. So, you know, if you want to uh, join us in January, I can invite you to do a presentation on it, uh, on uh, on the uh, on the next to last week of January, Sunday of January. Okay, so January has five Sundays again. Uh, if you, if, yes, let's, so let's make the invitation right now. I haven't received anything yet, so it would be my pleasure. Okay. Oh, great. You're officially invited for <laughs> January 23rd for the, uh, of the lecture on matter that you gave on your closing of your class. Okay. What, what, what I receive a golden letter, white paper invitation. Yeah. So, Carol, can you do our final prayer? Sure, absolutely. Luis, thank you so much for the inspiring lecture. Excellent. Infinite creator and supreme intelligence, we are grateful today to be together for our presentation with Luis. We are grateful for the in-depth knowledge that we have received that we will continue to grow and develop within it. We are having a better understanding of intelligence, the, the IQ, 
the EQ and the SQ for intelligent, emotional, and spiritual quotients. We are grateful today to have our spiritual benefactors with us, helping us, assisting us to open our minds, our hearts, open our pathway to greater knowledge and understanding, not only of the brain, but of the spiritual part of us as well, the God spot as was spoken. We are grateful for what we have received, the blessings on all levels, mental, spiritual, physical, and emotional. May we receive these blessings in the future as well as we continue in depth with our studies. May we be so happy that we have access to this wonderful information. These are our blessings and blessings that will continue throughout the week and throughout the year. May we turn our vices into virtues and may we constantly use our free will to the optimistic and the point of good. May we turn our thoughts to service and may we also pursue our studies as well. We humbly ask now for safety and protection as we go forth to family, friends, loved ones, and coworkers. May we see, receive the love, light, and peace of Christ within us, within our minds, within our bodies, within our spirit. And may we use this light and love for the betterment of all, for our brothers and sisters near and far, for those who are in need, those who are in need of greater healing and those who are finding the difficulties hard to bear. May we close now and ask for this love, light and peace to go with us, reminding ourselves to be beacons of light and gratitude. Go forth now in peace, so be it. <laughs>